Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be discussing poverty. This is an incredibly important issue, if only because it involves large groups of people. Again, in sociology, we do take a macro approach to studying society groups of people, and we do focus on large-scale macro problems such as poverty, along with micro facets such as individuals in poverty and why are those individuals in poverty, and then why are individuals that constitute a group in poverty as a group. A sociological perspective is going to look at systems and structures involved with poverty. It's also going to look at psychological factors involved with poverty, such as cognition, and also biological factors associated with poverty, such as age, which you might not think of as a biological factor, but it's associated with biology and development and ability and things along those lines that are associated with factors such as age. And so when we talk about poverty, we are going to take a biopsychosocial approach, even though we are in a sociology class. Yes, we're focusing on a social approach, a macro approach. But in order to understand groups of people, we have to understand all of its components, individuals, and then how those individuals interact with each other, and then the institutions of society itself. A really good question to ask initially, though, is why is there poverty in the United States? As you can see from this chart, poverty in the United States is often triple or double what it is in other countries, and you have to ask why. If you look at the socioeconomic status of the United States compared to any of these countries, we have more socioeconomic status than other countries. However, we have higher rates of poverty simultaneously, and that might seem counterintuitive. So we have to ask the question, why is there poverty in America? Americans make an average of $65,000 a year. That's $20,000 more next to the closest country behind us, which is England, when it comes to how much money somebody makes in a year. Yet we have higher rates of poverty than England. So again, we have to ask, why is there that disparity? If you look at global socioeconomic status, the United States is the 1%. We make more money than anybody else on the country, yet we still have poverty in our society. So a sociological answer, again, is going to look at systems and structures attached to poverty, such as we live in a capitalist economy. How is capitalism associated with poverty? The consolidation of wealth into the hands of the few, the, needs to, the mean, need to gain access to the means of production, capital to survive, the fact that we have to sell our labor to make money to be able to feed our families. How is inequality involved in poverty? Why do some groups of people have higher socioeconomic status than other groups of people? And so why is there a division between groups in the first place that results in inequality? We can look at all the forms of social stratification, such as race and sex and socioeconomic status and sexual orientation, all the ways that we divide into groups that results in inequitable structures and systems and access to these structures and systems. We can look at culture and a common way of life. And again, how is the common way of life associated with being in poverty? Well, think about different cultures, how they vary between educational attainment and what they expect for their lives. And is there a disparity between the upper class and lower class culture? And the disparity between the two cultures, is that associated with getting an education and getting a job to get some wealth, to get out of poverty? We can look at the markets. We can look at the job markets. We can look at it between epochs and time. We can look at the markets when it comes to access and who has access to the markets. We can also look at social change. When did the concept of poverty become important to us as a society? When did it become a social problem? So again, the book talks about how poverty began to really be addressed on a societal level, including government policies and procedures in the 1960s. And what we found was the increase in government programs and policies that were directed toward reducing poverty were effective. However, then the book talks about in the 70s and 80s how we started to remove those policies, and then you started to again start to see an increase in poverty. Again, general questions. Why should we care about poverty? Why is it important to label that as a social problem and find ways to help? 
But think about it. How many potential Einsteins and Lydia Sebastians are there in the lower classes that aren't going to good schools, that aren't being invested in by society, so they never get a chance to truly develop and fulfill their potential? Is that actually a thing? And yes, absolutely it's a thing. Children in poverty tend to go to worse schools. They tend to have less wealth, less educational attainment, less uh, job prestige in the end, which all you know accumulates into your socioeconomic status and your ability to access the markets, be able to access the systems and structures that dominate society, for example. So again, why should we care? Because again, especially when it comes to children, you know, we have to give every child a chance if people are going to be able to rise up on their merit and their ability. Should we create a system in which all children go to the same quality of school? you know, kind of remove that laissez-faire attitude from the education system and create a more social system so that every child has a chance to develop to the full, full, you know, to the fullest, for example. That's something that really gets me every time. Because when I'm teaching psychology, for example, when you have to teach about IQ, is there an association between your ability to score well on an intelligence test and your parents' socioeconomic status, whether or not you live in poverty? Absolutely. But the saddest thing is, the number one thing associated with being able to do well in an intelligence test, critiquing test as you may, it's did you eat today? I'm telling you, food, food insecurity, housing insecurity, these are huge factors when it comes to children's development, for example. And so we have to break down why should we care? Should we care? Based upon children and adults and the elderly and diverse groups. And at what point is it there are too many social programs? At what point are there not enough social programs? That's what we as a society have to come together and really discuss and come up with some answers because that's, again, how do we solve poverty and should we solve poverty? Because a really good question and we're going to look at in a little bit is this concept of is some poverty good? Why should a doctor make more money than someone who works in a restaurant? Is you know some inequality between good groups good to incentivize people and to motivate them? But at what point is the society so inequitable that you know the person working in a restaurant can barely eat that week and then the person who has higher socioeconomic status is dominating the markets and making tons of money. So again, we're going to look at it from several different angles and we're going to do that by applying the theories. The book opens up talking about how to measure poverty. And again, what is poverty is socially constructed. It's us that decides what the poverty line is. In the United States, we've had the same definition for how to define the poverty line since 1963. The government estimates the cost of a family to eat, and then they multiply that number by three. That number does not take into account any other factors, such as living expenses or anything else. Um, it's really just looking at food cost and then estimating it. And so again, is it realistic? Should we as a society come together and determine how to better measure poverty that incorporates all the factors, such as electric bills, gas bills, water bills, food, car payments, car insurance, housing, inflation, the ability to save any money that month. You know, so there's all these other factors that people aren't thinking about when we go ahead and measure it, but that's how it's measured currently. It's simply estimated cost of a family to three to eat times three. Variables associated with poverty. I made several slides because there's several variables that your book goes over. Race is one of the most important ones. As you can see from these charts, 42.4% of people are white, 28.8% are Hispanic, 23% are black, and 3.7% are Asian. Now, if you look at the American population, 60% are white. So that means that poverty is underrepresented by whites. 28.7% of the population is Hispanic, so that's very close to the number of Hispanics that there are. However, African Americans are only you know, 12% of the population, yet they're twice as likely to be in poverty because of their race. And Asians, again, are underrepresented. And why is that? Is that because of culture and educational attainment? And so when you go to ask, how is race associated with poverty? Historically in America, white Americans that were male had access to 
the capitalist system, to educations, to jobs, to gaining wealth. Anyone that was not male and that wasn't European descendant or otherwise labeled white was removed from being able to compete. Therefore, for hundreds of years in America, only white Americans could compete. And of those white Americans that were male that could compete, the only the ones that really had good education, good jobs, some wealth, some family status really had a chance to compete anyhow. So for a very long time in the United States, only a few elite white males have been competing with each other, with each other as the bourgeoisie, the upper class, and everybody else was competing as the proletariat, the working class, okay? And so when you ask why is you know, African Americans twice as likely to be in poverty, how much of that has to do with racism and subjugation? When you look at the feminization of poverty coming up next, how much of that has to do with, again, sexism and subjugation of females by males? So, you know, we have to look at the effect of prejudice and discrimination upon the ability to access the markets, the systems and structures, to access the education system, to get a job in the capitalist market, to be able to compete. Is your race associated with that? And if so, that then accounts for a proportion of why race is associated with poverty. When it comes to sex and gender, again, the same thing. Women were historically denied access to compete, denied access to go to college, to be able to get a good job, to make money, to even be citizens, for example. So again, women are more likely to be in poverty because of prejudice and discrimination that has historically kept women down. They you know, make 20 cents less on average than a male, for example. Um, the types of jobs they're choosing are those the ones that pay a lot of money. And so that's another thing that's associated with it. Age is another factory. Again, you're going to find that children and the elderly have higher percentages of poverty than non-children and elderly. And again, why is this? And so again, children being born into poverty, they're being born into high households that are living in poverty. And then a high percentage of the elderly, same exact thing. So when we're looking at age as an association, we have to recognize that children and the elderly are more likely to be in poverty, and then you have to go further and say why. Why are children likely to be in poverty? And then you have to look at the family structures, the family socioeconomic status. Then you have to ask why are the elderly more likely to be in poverty? Is it because of physical limitations? Is it because of how much money they made? Is, you know, there's a whole lot of questions that we have to ask here. Region is another factor. The book talks about how the South has more higher rates of poverty than the North. Why? Is it because of the job markets and industrialization of the North? Is it because of the concentration of population in the North? Um, but that equivoc equivocates into a poorer health measures for people in the South. For example, having higher rates of heart disease and diabetes and cancer and things along those lines. Why is that? Then it says that the West, followed by the South, then the Midwest, then the Northeast are ranked in order of like most likely to least likely to be in poverty. And the graph does a pretty good job of showing this. Very high rates in Kentucky, Alabama, Mississippi, um, low rates in Minnesota, but is that because of population disparity? Lower rates in the East Coast of New Jersey and Vermont, New Hampshire and Connecticut. So again, we have to look at how much of that is due to population, how much of that has to do with job markets and things along those lines. And again, that's the complexity of sociology is we can look at these factors and say, yes, you know, race and sex and region are associated with poverty, but the harder question is why? And so we can look at that quantitatively using numbers by doing statistics to pinpoint the areas where it is. And then we can also go out and qualitatively examine why to get some open-ended feedback and some information from other people. Subjective perceptions of poverty, for example. But again, when we're looking at poverty, we have to ask all these different questions, like how much of culture is associated with poverty? Is there a cultural difference between Asian Americans and African Americans? Is that why Asian Americans are less likely to be in poverty and African Americans are more likely to be in poverty? Is it because of disparities in educational attainment between Asians and African Americans? Because Asians pride you know, educational attainment more than African Americans? Because Asians get more educational attainment than whites and African Americans significantly. Twice as many degrees as African Americans, or three times as many degrees, and twice as many degrees as, as white Americans. And so you got to ask the question of why is that the case? And so what's the association between culture and poverty? What's the association between socioeconomic status, the ability to get the job, to get the access in the first place? Historically, Asians didn't have that much access. But over the last several decades, they've gained more and more access. 
without experiencing as much racism and ethnocentrism as they had in the past, such as with the Chinese Exclusion Act and how they were treated in the 1900s, early 1900s, when their citizenship was removed. The family structure, again, is a huge thing to point out as a variable. And the book talks about all kinds of family structure patterns, okay, such as people that are married are less likely to be in poverty than people that are not married. Single parents are more likely to be in poverty than those that are not single parents. Uh, when you look at single parent families, many of them tend to be headed by females, which again contributes to the feminization of poverty because females, especially like after divorces or just being single parents or not making as much money as their male counterparts. And then when they have to have the stress of the head of the household, because of all these factors, they're more likely to be in poverty. Um, the quote from your book of all families headed by just a woman, 31.6% live in poverty compared to 15% of 8.8 uh, .8 families headed by a man. And so again, you have to ask this question, why is there a disparity between females and males? And again, we have to look at the socioeconomic factors such as prejudice, discrimination, oppression, blocked access to education and jobs. Now, a lot of that is changing in modern times. And I bet we're going to see some of these changing numbers because women are getting more college degrees than men. Women are having less babies in general. Women's socioeconomic status is increasing. So I bet we might see some of these disparities in these numbers. But again, this goes back to hundreds of years of American sexism in which women have been subjugated into the lower classes and haven't had as much of a chance to compete. And again, is it a culture of females versus males? Is that a factor, you know? Are females culturally expected to take on different gender roles than males? And is that associated with historical decisions to go to college and get jobs? Or is it just, you know, biological factors? Women had the baby. They're the, you know, and then society then imposes these expectations of women to spend more time with kids with the men. And is that why they're not making as much money? And is that why they're more locked in? Or is it a time factor because males aren't contributing? And so women are having by no choice other than, you know, the, they just have to take on the kids. So is it male culture not contributing enough to the single parent households, for example? And so there's just so many things we have to think about. And so when we open up Pandora's box of cultural reasons for poverty, and then we start looking at different cultures based upon your race or your age or your sex, or your sexual orientation, how is that associated with it? And then if we start looking at lower class culture and then factoring in biological factors such as disability status, you know, is disability status associated with your ability to go to work? And so there's just so many complex things. I wish we could end poverty in one day, you know, and it really to you know, jump into poverty it would take way more than just one week. But again, in this social problems class, we're really looking at it one week at a time and we're looking at a new, you know, kind of chapter each time. And so there's just so much we love to talk about with poverty. But again, hopefully you can start to see that each one of these associations with poverty is an entire Pandora's box of studies that we can engage in. Because if we delve into the family structures and family diversities and each family type, you know, you have so many different family types. You have married families that are heterosexual, married families that are same sex, single parents that are heterosexual, single parents that are same sex, single parents that identify as male, single parents that identify as female, single parents that identify with a number of other genders. And then how does all of that play into family structure and poverty and culture and access to socioeconomic status and access to good health and things along those lines? And so, again, your sexuality is associated with your access to health care. And so is your race and the treatment by the healthcare system is associated with your race and your sexuality, for example. So then those in poverty compounded with their race or the sexuality can be way more at risk for the health problems just based upon their identification in all these different groups. And so hopefully you guys are starting to see that this is ridiculously complex stuff, but that's why each one of these associations we would have to study in depth to really explore it and understand it. Again, we're just doing a quick coverage, but this chart right here is perfect for it because again, it shows you how likely you are, the percentage of people in poverty that are married, only 5%, 6% are, you know, in poverty that are married, 
headed by a man only, the number is much lower. It's only about, you know, 17%. And then as you can see, sorry, 15.8%. And then as you can see with headed by females, 31.6% of those in poverty, which is a significantly higher number. So you can basically say single parent female head of households are six times as likely to be in poverty as somebody who's married. And so that's kind of the stuff we're talking about, okay? Um, and then variables associated with poverty, again, socioeconomic status is the ultimate one. And again, socioeconomic status is your educational attainment, plus your job prestige, plus your wealth, plus your location in all those groups, race, sex, sexual orientation, religion, other cultural factors. And then the, all of that equals your socioeconomic status, which then equals your life chances, you know. And again, your socioeconomic status can then be measured compared to other people where you can be socially located within the system. So think about it. Where are you and your family located compared to other families in society, okay? And give yourself like a relative understanding based upon, your, you know, your family's education and job and wealth, etc., of where you all are located, and then you can kind of get a various idea of what the poverty level is based upon that, you know, and so the, again, how do we measure the poverty level? Is it a number or is it a sense of, you know, how, where am I in compared to other people? But essentially your socioeconomic status, your education, your job prestige, your wealth, and all those other variables are directly associated with factors associated with poverty. And you can do this on a global level and look at this chart shows child mortality for wealthy nations versus poor nations. And you can see that, you know, poor nations, child mortality is 10 times as much as it was for wealthy nations. And so, again, the socioeconomic status of your country itself directly translates to whether people live or die. It is that intense. It also directly translates not only to child mortality, but, you know, longevity, how long you'll live again, you know, across the lifespan. So when we go to explain poverty, a really good way to frame it, again, from a sociological perspective, you have these three theories, two of which are macro, functionalism and conflict theory, and one of them is micro, symbolic interactionism. So we can then approach poverty by looking at it from big group picture or also from the individual level or small group picture to really understand it. But when it comes to functionalism, remember that there are in society, there's only so many social roles and there's not as many social roles on top as there are on bottom. So we do need a system, you know, for filtering people. So the education system, for example, what's the purpose of it? One is to socialize you and teach, but it also filters you into white collar, blue collar. And it's in an ideal society, the best and the brightest, you know, who work the hardest, they're the ones who should be allowed to rise up, you know, and then fulfill those elite social roles because there's only so many of them. But what you're going to see from conflict theory is your access to those elite social roles is based upon, you know, your parents' socioeconomic status, for example. So even though the ideal education system enables people to rise up based upon their merit, only those that have wealthy parents, for example, even get into the good schools that are located into the neighborhoods to be able to compete in the end for those super wealthy jobs, for example. And so again, for functionalism, yes, we need some inequality because again, why, how do we motivate someone to spend 20 years learning to be a doctor and every weekend they're studying versus someone who just works in a restaurant where they don't have to spend all their lives studying, they just put in their 40 hours or whatever they're working. And so you don't need as much incentive. And so you got to ask those questions. Do we need some inequality so that we can motivate people to take on these elite social roles that require tons of work and learning and sacrifice and discipline to actually fulfill it? So again, some inequality can be good. However, if there's too much inequality, such as the disparity between the rich and poor, the working class and the owning class, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, the subjugation of males by females, at what point is too much inequality unacceptable? And so again, the fact that society was oppressing women and forcing them into the lower classes, being powerless without the dependency on a man, became too much inequality to the point that we had several women's rights movements that continue to this day because that just got to the point where it was unacceptable and it was causing society to be in dysfunction. And then symbolic interactionism, again, is looking at it that we're the ones who built the society. 
were the ones who built a society that is unequally distributed into social roles in which the elite social roles can only be competitive for those who can gain access to those social roles and we're also the ones who developed a system of inequality in which some people are in poverty and some people are not in poverty and again you have that back and forth what's better communism capitalism and again in america we're not a communist but we're not purely capitalist either we do have social programs it's not 100 percent dog eat dog world out there because we found that that did not work as a country Albeit it's an interesting economic philosophy, if you don't throw at least some breadcrumbs to the poor, they could result in just detrimental death and famine and genocide, but also rioting and overthrowing of the government and just general unrest socially. And so when it comes to poverty, again, we're going to ask, what's the function of inequality? What's the function of poverty? Does that motivate people? We're going to ask, at what point is there too much poverty that we have to draw a line? And then we're going to ask, is this the only way to build a society within which one in five children, for example, exist in poverty? And so the consequences of poverty, and this is a good picture if you guys are interested, and it shows you uh, the world's life expectancy map. And so if you think about you know, the countries with the highest gross domestic product, where the citizens have the highest socioeconomic status, you're going to see huge disparities in lifespan, how long you end up living, okay? So notice the blue in Africa compared to the orange in Asia in Latin America compared to the green in Europe and North America, and you're going to see big disparities. And then also notice that Canada and Europe have higher life expectancies than the United States. Is that because they don't have a private health care system? See, they have a socialized healthcare system where everybody has access. Is that why people are living longer there than they are in the United States, for example? And so again, we have to ask these questions. But again, when we're going to study poverty, we've got to look at it from a biopsychosocial approach. Again, a biology approach, a physical limitations, you know, the motivation from the body, the brain structure itself, psychological approach, motivation and emotions and cognitions. What does it take to get up and go to work every day? And then a social approach, looking at systems and structures. But those in poverty tend to have less educational attainment, less wealth, more government assistance reliance, less health quality, including infant mortality, physical and psychological health, more likely to have been arrested, more likely to have children, more stress experienced by the family, less brain development, including cognitive abilities, much of which based upon the school's and the challenges that they're faced with in life when it comes to learning rocket science. More antisocial behavior. Stress, again, is associated with the social context in that the stress of poverty then affects the interdynamics of the family, which then is associated with things like increased rates of domestic violence and child abuse. Um, they experience more housing insecurity. They're more likely to be victims of crime and commit crimes too. Less access to all the institutions, education, the workforce, you know. They experience poorer sanitation and have more uh, poor water quality and also lower literacy rates. So again, there's so many consequences of poverty. And so we as a society have to ask, at what point do we draw the line? At what point is there too much poverty? What other solutions can we come up with to help those in poverty? And should we end poverty or do we need a little bit of poverty to motivate people? Again, from a global perspective, as that picture shows, that gross domestic product from this last one, this is, again, gross domestic product. These are your higher gross domestic, gross domestic product countries, your middle gross domestic product, and then your lower gross domestic product directly translating to overall health and equality. So what you're going to see is this is, graph has the concentration of the wealth. Again, the richest fifth of the world has 74% of the wealth. So then that just trickles down. And that has a direct association to things like lifespan, access to health care, and things along those lines. Your book also introduces the modernization theory. And again, this is the idea that these richest fifth countries have modernized and has had a chance to build the infrastructure. 
And then you have the dependency theory that these poorer countries are more dependent on the richest countries, not only for raw materials, but also technology and access to other things along those lines. And then overarchingly, you have the world systems theory. And the world system theory says, basically, the way the world looked during colonialism, it still pretty much looks like that. You know, you had the dominant groups, the dominant countries that dominated society and subjugated everybody else in the lower classes, and it still continues to look that way. Again, reducing poverty. Are the poor neglected in America? Are we actually addressing it enough? Should we do more? Things to think about. Do we need anti-poverty programs and policies? Again, we've been shown that they work, but at what point do we need to like cut off those programs to motivate people to work? Because again, we can't just take care of everyone, you know what I mean? People have to work, we gotta get up, we gotta go do our jobs, we have to fulfill these roles. We need some motivation, and the fear of poverty, for example, motivates people because we know we need a house, we know we're gonna need to survive or we're gonna die. So again, we need some of that motivation, but you know, again, there comes to a point where we also need to help those, you know, those in, that are struggling. And then again, global poverty, can it be cured and should it be cured? Do we need competition? Does competition create ingenuity? And again, if you read like Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand, the biggest critique in that book is that if you take away those that are really working the hardest, and you take away that you know the benefits that they get from their hard work, and you just equally distribute among the masses, how does that affect you know your society in general? And again, that's that comparison of like communist Russia to America, and is there a disparity in overall quality of life, for example? So again, we have to look at what's the best system. Is it a capitalist system? Is it a communist system? Is it a social democracy? Is it something in between? You know, a lot of good questions here. So poverty is a massive social problem because it, so many people are affected by it. And it's a global phenomena that's not just situated in America, like race, you know, our idea of black versus white versus Asian kind of thing in America. Um, it's a global problem. It's something that we should be thinking about. Again, there are so many variables associated with it. But again, that math equation, your education plus your job gets you your wealth, is then that's your best bet to like attacking socioeconomic status and understanding how that is associated with poverty. But then you also have to look at all those other factors like race and sex and gender and sexual orientation, ethnicity, because those are also associated with poverty because those are associated with whether or not you're able to gain access to the systems and structures that have the wealth and have the power to get you out of poverty. So really good.